So welcome everybody. Um, it's exciting to start our second day after very exciting um, set of talks yesterday. So there was a slight change of schedule. Uh, today we're going to have first of Killian's uh, Killian Weinberger's three lectures, introducing us to the uh, sort of uh, ba very basics of machine learning. The goal is to start from uh, linear regression, something that we are all familiar with, and take us all the way to convolutional neural networks and some um, cutting edge uh, tools and approaches. Uh, the lecture contents will be um, synced with the uh, hands-on session material that is going to become available tomorrow. So this is very exciting. And um, Killian is a, um, He's, he's very popular as a lecturer who gives these amazing lectures. His courses are always oversubscribed. And uh, I'm really happy to uh, be able to bring him over to our school. So with that, Killian, floor is all yours. Um, so hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Killian. I'm a professor in the computer science department, and I do machine learning, and have been doing it for a long time. And uh, actually, one quick thing, I, I have actually, the last two years I was in sabbatical. So I've actually the whole pandemic, I was gone. So I've never actually taught on uh, Zoom. So we will see how this goes, but please, please don't hesitate to interrupt me and ask any questions. Um, also, if you, you know, this is in some sense, this is very, very hard, kind of in three lectures, try to, to kind of squeeze in, give an overview of machine learning. So if you're interested, uh, you know, as Una said, my, my actually lectures from Cornell are on YouTube and a lot of you watching them. So, you know, if you want more details, uh, you can see them all there. All right. Um, I also, the, last, last but not least, I've never taught physicists before. So I don't really know what you guys know and what you don't know. So again, please ask and let me know if something's not clear. Um, okay. So. Machine learning. So what's machine learning? Uh, a lot of you have probably heard of machine learning. Um, it's been around for actually quite some time. Um, I would say the first machine learning algorithm that was invented was arguably uh, the perceptron in 1959. So it's been a long time. That was actually here at Cornell University. And, um, but, you know, uh, but only lately it has, you know, kind of reached a, you know, a level of popularity where a lot of people on the street, et cetera, uh, know about it. And suddenly if I look at my own teaching, you know, when I started as a professor, my class is very small, very few people were interested in machine learning. It was very, you know, it was a very nerdy subject. And now actually, you know, everybody wants, wants, to, wants to hear about it. Okay, so what's the paradigm? What's the basic idea behind machine learning? And, and in a nutshell, actually, it's the following, right? So computers, what you typically have, you can, you can, you, you can see my screen, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, usually you have a computer and you put in a program and you put in some data and the program munches this data and generates an output, right? And this is, this is kind of the way computers were intended originally. So for example, if you want to play a movie file, right? So then your data is the movie and the program is a decoder. If you look up on Wikipedia, how is an MPEG-4 encoded or something, so you write a decoder and then output is the movie on the screen. And so this works great if you have some data and you know exactly how to process it. Um, but oftentimes you don't, right? So oftentimes, for example, the data that I see is images of you know, fMRI scans, right? And so the doctor's asking me, here's an fMRI scan of the patient. Does that person, patient have Alzheimer's, yes or no, right? And nobody knows how to write such a program. It's impossible. We don't know how to do this, right? Or, you know, maybe less serious, like you have a picture of a cat, a picture of a dog or something. And you know, you have, you know, you have a picture of, of some animal and you want to know is the cat or dog or something, right? So, so you would like to put a program that takes an image and detects if there's a cat in it or a dog in it. And so machine learning basically is for these kind of scenarios where you say, you know, I have, I don't know how to write a program. I have some tasks that I would like to do, but I don't know how to, how to write a program to do it, but I can show you examples. So essentially what that means is I have data and I know the output that I want. So basically if the doctor goes to me and says, hey, here is some data, here's some fMRI scans, 
from patients that I took 10 years ago. And now I know that they have Alzheimer's or not, right? So now it's obvious, right? At the time it wasn't, but now it's obvious. So here are the fMRI scans. And so basically I can give you the data and I can give you the outputs that I would have liked your program to produce. Can you produce me a program? Right? And that's, that's the idea essentially behind machine learning. And uh, that initially seemed like a crazy idea, but um, you know, it, it's really you know, started working about 20 years ago and, and uh, is now basically everywhere, right? So search engines, for example, and machine learning, you know, it's a totally impossible problem, right? Someone types in one word, you have billions of web pages, what do you want, right? It's, it's not a well-defined problem, but um, you can actually learn, you know, by, by showing examples saying, here's someone typed in this and they wanted to go to this web page and you basically annotate a lot, a lot of web pages. The algorithm can learn how to do this. So machine learning you basically write a program that learns how to write programs. And, and so this, the output can literally be C code or it can just be a long vector of parameters that specifies this program. Okay, so today we're not gonna go into this too much, but um, we, I will show you some, some small cases um, and there's different types of machine learning. And the big picture is basically supervised versus unsupervised learning. So we go into supervised learning. Supervised learning is where I show you data points and their labels. So I show an fMRI scan and say, this person had Alzheimer. And here's an fMRI scan, this person didn't have Alzheimer. Right? And the idea is that the algorithm slowly extracts patterns from this and learns you know, what's specific about the fMRI scans from people that actually have uh, Alzheimer's, for example. And <clears throat> the, uh, as I said earlier, the very, very first algorithm was 1959, was the perceptron. Actually, let me write this down because actually it came from Cornell University and uh, it was Frank Rosenblatt was the guy who invented it. He was a psychologist. Um, at the time, actually, he was, the media went crazy when he, discovered, when he made his discovery, uh, but his colleagues actually kind of didn't really take him seriously. They thought, you know, that was a little bit too out there. Um, and so the perceptron is a classification algorithm and classification algorithm is exactly this. You have data of two different classes, for example, Alzheimer's or not Alzheimer's or cat versus dog. And you, I give you some training examples. Now, I, you know, you want to, uh, given a new image or a new example, you're supposed to say, is this cat or is this dog? Or is this person, does this person have Alzheimer's? Yes or no. And how does the perceptron work? The perceptron is a linear algorithm and it's a hyperplane-based hyper -based classifier. And I'll explain to you in a minute, uh, explain to you how this works. So here's how this, basically we have some data and we call them X1, Y1 and X N, Y N. And so here X is always a vector. That's the, for example, the image of the cat and Y is, you know, Y is element of plus one or minus one where plus one could be cat and minus one is dog. And so X, we assume X is just a vector that describes my data instance. So if you have an image, this could just be all the pixels kind of concatenated as a long vector, right? Or it could be something else. It could be measurements of like how wide is the, the, the face, you know, does it have pointy ears, you know? So every single dimension is some measurement. In the raw form, it would just be pixels, but it can be many, many different things, right? The important thing is that we assume that your data is, just a vector, it's just a point in a high dimensional space. And that's the assumption we're making throughout. And so you can always do this, right? Because if you can store your data in a computer, a computer just has long, you know, for, for a computer, everything is just a long string of numbers. So everything is vectorizable in a computer, right? So, and there's of course better and worse ways of doing this, but, but that's not get into this. And so the perceptron classifier essentially does the following. You have some images, let's say we have our, our uh, cats and we have our dogs here and these are my training samples dogs and these here are cats um, <clears throat> what it's doing is essentially just learns a hyperplane that separates these from each other so basically just the dogs are on one side and the cats are on the other side All right so in, uh, how do you how do you specify a hyperplane well you, you need a vector so you have a Hyperplane is basically the following is specified by W transpose X plus B is all the points that are equal zero. That's all the points that lie on the hyperplane. Um, and so here, the W vector is essentially this. 
Let me do this. Yeah. This here is my W vector. B is the offset, how far I'm how far I'm off here. And uh, if I'm if this is exactly zero, then the point is on the hyperplane. If this is greater zero, then I'm in the dog category. If it's less than zero, then I'm in the cat category. And so the insight that Frank Rosenblatt had was we take this data and he made a very strong assumption. He has assumed that there is such a hyperplane that you can actually separate these two classes from each other. So the first assumption was there's two classes called the plus one, minus one. Second one assumption is there's a, there exists a hyperplane such that I can position the hyperplane uh, that is positioned such that all the positive points lie on one side, all the negative points lie on the other side. Right? And so what he could show is that the perceptron uh, algorithm uh, that he introduced could always find such a hyperplane in this case. So it doesn't have to find the one that, you know, the best one, you know, there may be many, but right? you could also have hyperplane here and here, they all separate uh, cats versus dogs. Um, but the perceptron algorithm basically says, if such a hyperplane exists, we can find it. And <clears throat> once you have such a hyperplane, so basically then you just, let's say you have a new test point, then you just compute W, uh, transpose x plus plus b and then you check is it greater zero then you you say that's a dog if it's less than zero it's a cat right? and so that's how the algorithm works <clears throat> okay are there any questions at this point <clears throat> i don't know i don't see any okay um <clears throat> No questions, Una, am I good to go? All right, good. Um, then we have regression and classification. So actually, let me just focus on classification here because I think most of you actually know, know linear regression, so it's not uh, all that interesting. Um, <clears throat> so this is the classification setting. The regression setting is when you have data points like this, and you try to find a hyperplane that kind of fits these. So you find a direction that actually um, fits these data points. That's what we call regression, and the other one we call classification. Let me for now focus on classification problem. So we, we basically have two classes, positive and negative points, and we want to separate them. All right, so the algorithm that I want to introduce now is actually logistic regression. And let me just go here, logistic regression. Can I get a quick show of hands? Who's familiar with the log logistic regression? Can, is, there, is there a way to do this in, in Zoom? Can people just... Uh, yeah, go to reactions. Everybody go to reactions at the bottom. They can raise your raise hand. Um, I see. So what's, what's the green? Yeah. Maybe the, the green tick means yes and red thing means no. Um, uh, yeah, you hand. can do that too. Hand, I think, means yes, because you oh, hand, raise okay. hand okay, if good. you know. Yeah. So hand and green are the same. All right. So, well, fair number of people. Oh, a lot of you guys. Okay. Of course, it's a highly biased sample set here. Um, <laughs> It also changes, so people seem to be forgetting live what logistic regression is. Um, <clears throat> so maybe, maybe, uh, okay. So uh, this is good. So let me let me just uh, go over it. And okay, so so the assumption is we have data, and so again we have y one and you know x and y n. So these are our data pairs. So this here again is our you know instance x element of r d, some d-dimensional vector. And y is y i element of plus one minus one. So we basically have a positive point or a negative point. And uh, let me just draw this one more time because now I'm on a new page. So again, we say, okay, here are my positive points and here are my, my negative points. Maybe I make them circles. And the goal is to find a hyperplane that separates them. And so, uh, Frank Rosenblatt's perceptron assumed that there's a hyperplane that perfectly separate, uh, separates them. The perceptron doesn't make such a strong assumption. Uh, so sorry, the, the logistic regression doesn't make such a strong assumption. Logistic regression essentially says, 
okay, there should be a hyperplane that actually roughly separates them. So it's okay if there's one cross here, um, it doesn't actually break the algorithm. Uh, whereas perceptron actually would, have, that would break it. And <clears throat> okay, so one thing that's really, really important is that in machine learning, every algorithm makes assumptions, right? And if you don't make assumptions, you can't possibly, um, you can't possibly classify anything during test time, right? Because if I could actually say, let's say we have a new point here, and this point can be anything you want, right? Then, you know, I can't possibly predict what this is, right? So you have to, you know, uh, you have to kind of say, all right, well, I, I make some assumptions that basically the data is somewhat well behaved. And in this case, the way logistic regression approaches it, it assumes that there's two distributions that give rise to the two different labels. And these are basically uh, unimodal distributions. And it's easiest to assume they're just Gaussian. So if you basically picture a Gaussian here and then Gaussian here and say, well, here's our, the, the two means, right? And so essentially the data of the dogs and cats basically come from Gaussian, you know, with, with separate means. And essentially what I'm trying to find for a new test point, I basically know which one is more likely in like, you know, this Gaussian or in the other Gaussian. And <clears throat> now we are not going to model these Gaussians. Instead, we just do kind of, this is kind of the mental framework that we'll be using for, uh, for, for a logistic regression. Question, question. Yeah. Uh um, how do you define roughly? Roughly, this is a very good point. It's roughly Gaussian. Uh, it just, so essentially what you want is that a uh, Gaussian distribution is not a terrible approximation. So you really want them to kind of in one big cluster. So what would be bad, for example, if you have a second cluster here, right? That's very non-Gaussian because you actually have two, two big bumps here, right? <laughs> so that's, that's is essentially what it is. Um, Usually these algorithms make some assumptions on the data, but they're violated, it still kind of works. Um, but uh, for example, if you had other crosses here, right, then you really couldn't find a hyperplane anymore that separates the circles from the crosses in the naive form, right? So that doesn't work anymore. Yeah, thanks, thanks for bringing that up. Okay, so uh, if you assume uh, and I'm not going, I'm gonna skip some derivations here because we you have to. Um, but basically, the modeling assumption of, of, this, uh, of, of um, the logistic regression is the following. So we have our x and y pairs, and these are drawn from some distribution. And so we basically saw, you know, our x, i, y, i is drawn from some distribution that we don't know, right? So only God herself knows that distribution, right? We have no business knowing this, but we can make some modeling assumptions, right? And so we can basically say, well, okay, the p of x x uh, comma y, we know that's obviously p of uh, x given y times p of y, right? And so the first thing we assume is that these two are equally likely for both of them. So that's just, um, so we say p of y equals plus one equals p of y equals minus one. Y you, you know, you, uh, if that's not the case, it's also fine later, you know, but just, just for this, this brief lecture here, we just assume this. And so we ultimately make our modeling assumption on this distribution. So uh, actually, sorry, let me just, let me just, let me just shortcut this a little. Here's what we're saying. We're saying P of Y given X takes the following form. One over one plus E to the minus W transpose X plus B equals one. So that's, that's actually the, the modeling assumption of logistic regression. And this here is the sigmoid function. Now, here's a question. Who has seen sigmoids before? Can you raise your hands? <clears throat> okay, good, good, good. All right, okay, good. So where does the sigmoid come from, right? This is a sigmoid function is the, this, this function here, this is the sigmoid, whoa. whoa. Sigmoid function does the following. It looks like this. Right, so this here is a uh, sigmoid here, sigmoid of z equals one over one plus e to the minus c. That's this function here. At zero, it's exactly 0 0.5. And the limit approach is one and zero here. So if z is very, very large, 
If z is very, very large, this becomes one. And if z is very, very negative, it becomes zero. And where does this function come from? It comes from the following, that if you actually have, imagine you have the following setup, where you have two Gaussian distributions. And this here is my plus one Gaussian, this here is my minus one Gaussian. And I have data sampled from these two Gaussians. And now I want to know, this here is my, my x here, and I want, to, uh, I want to know what's the probability that, uh, that I'm sampled, a like given x that I'm sampled from the second Gaussian. And so this, this probability actually, if I'm very, very negative, will be zero, right? I'm way more likely to be sampled from this Gaussian here, right, than from the, from the right Gaussian. So when my x is, is very negative, oh, let's actually, sorry, let's call this c. When my z is very negative, then I'm here, right? And my z is very positive, and if I'm right in the middle, the probability is exactly 0.5. Like if I'm right in the middle between these two Gaussians, I have no idea if I, if I was sampled from this Gaussian, from the right Gaussian or from the left Gaussian. And as, I'm, as my z becomes larger, I'm more and more likely to be sampled from the, from the positive Gaussian. So from, and my probability that I'm actually positive becomes one. Okay, does that make sense? So one more time, I have two Gaussians that sample, you know, from which I sample positive and negative points. Now I have a new test point. And I want to know, given where this, this test point, let's call it z, right? Given that this test point is, for example, here or here or here, what's the probability that I was drawn from this positive point? And that exactly, the, this probability is exactly the sigmoid function, sigmoid of z. So when I'm, you know, the further right I am, the more likely I'm, 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 I'm from the positive uh, distribution. So p of plus one becomes one. And the further left I am, if I'm in this direction, then basically the probability of being positive becomes very, very small. And so that's the, so in, in here you can basically see that we are kind of uh, baking in these, these two Gaussians into our modeling assumption. So the moment we use a sigmoid, we actually essentially saying, oh yeah, there's these two kind of clusters, right? To be specific, it doesn't actually have to be a Gaussian. It can just be any distribution from the exponential family. Right? So it's actually a little bit of a less, uh, uh, less rigid assumption than I make it seem here. Um, but I am I'm kind of baking a modeling assumption into, into my model. And so with logistic regression, I'm basically trying to find this hyperplane such that I have this line here. And if I would go along this line, I would get exactly the sigmoid probability. Basically saying, if I move along this line, aha, here, I'm very, very likely to be positive. Here, I'm very, very likely to be negative. And essentially what I'm doing, I'm projecting all my data onto this line, okay? And so the more further I'm going out, the more likely I'm saying it's positive, and here, the more likely I'm saying it's negative. Um, does this make sense? Can you sum up or something if this makes sense? <clears throat> Okay, I see thumbs, some thumbs up. Okay, that's. <clears throat> okay, you can also give a thumb down if it doesn't make sense, or, or a red cross if it doesn't make sense. <clears throat> okay, good, perfect. So that's the idea behind the regression. And so if I make this modeling assumption, I can now actually. Uh, so one more time, I say p of y equals one given x equals one over one plus e to the minus uh, w transpose x plus b. It follows very clearly that uh, if I say pi of one, that I take the opposite, I get this, this thing, one plus e to the w transpose x plus b. So it's just here, I'm just, uh, these two are just negated. And so because y is element of plus one or minus one, I can write, P of y given x equals one over one plus e to the minus w transpose x plus b times y. Okay, <clears throat> and let's, let's just for a second think about this a little bit. So this here is basically now here my hyperplane. This says if this is positive, that means I lie on the positive side of the hyperplane. If this is negative, then I'm lying on the negative side of the hyperplane. And I'm multiplying this by my label. The label again is positive or negative, it's just one or minus one. So if the label is greater than zero, and this here is also greater than zero, then this two is a large number, but I take the minus, I take the negative, right? So this becomes a very small number. So I just get one, right? <clears throat> and 
<coughs> if you have, uh, if they have contradicting labels, so basically saying I'm lying on the, you know, this is one and this is kind of, uh, this here is negative, then this here becomes something very, very large, right? And one over something very large becomes something very, very small. So <coughs> essentially what I'm saying, if, you know, what's probably that I'm, pos that I'm positive, if, this, if I'm on the positive side of the hyperplane, then the probability that I'm positive is very, it's very large. Probably that I'm negative is very, very small. Make sense? Please thumbs up or thumbs down. I see just the aggregate. I actually don't even see it, who says what. So you can be totally honest. <clears throat> okay, perfect. Um, good stuff. So now we, you know, we uh, try to learn this hyperplane, right? So we basically have this, we have this problem, we made this assumption, we have our data, right? Our positive and our negative points. And we want to find a hyperplane that these are separated. We now have our modeling assumption. And now we need to position the W such that, you know, it's optimally positioned. Well, what does that mean? We use the negative log likelihood. I'm sure you guys all know about this. So essentially what we're trying to do is we maximize the probability, the likelihood of our data. So we learn our W and B to maximize the probability of our data. Let me, let me show you this B. A little rigorous here, so we say P of X1, Y1, comma, X2, Y2, Xn, Yn, and B. And uh, well, how do you know? What can we do now? We can make one, we can, we can use one more assumption. And that's the following that basically our data is IID. So our pairs here earlier, we had these pairs X1, they're all drawn from some distribution D, I, I, D. So uh, independently identically distributed. So we basically just sample uh, data points, you know, one by one. And so imagine for example, we have Alzheimer's, right? You just take patients, right? And these are different people. So the fact that the previous patient had Alzheimer's really has nothing to do with the current patient. So they're independent. So then this becomes the product. And we can actually of I, P of um, Y, I given X, I, W, P of X, I. And so this is just, all I did is actually did two things. I, I you know, factored this. And then I, I decompose it into P of X, Y comma X is P of Y given X times P of X. Um, and if you now take the log, then you can see this just becomes log of P of Y I given X I comma W and plus log of P of X I, but that actually really doesn't matter, right? Because that has nothing to do with our W. Like, you know, our modeling, assumption says nothing about the probability of a patient coming in. It just says, given a patient comes, you know, that comes in, <coughs> what's the probability that he or she has Alzheimer's? So this con conditional labor probability <coughs> is modeled, the P of X independent of W. So we can just drop it as just a constant. <coughs> okay. And if you now plug in our definition, so we have this bad boy here, Right, and we plug this in here. <coughs> then what we get is the following: e max w comma b i. Now we take the log of, and now we do a little bit of arithmetic, and the log of one minus log of this log of one is of course just zero, so we get a minus here, and we just do the log of this down here. Okay, does that? I hope that makes sense to everybody. I'm going a little faster because I know physicists are good at math. If you guys were computer scientists, that would, would slow down. And what we get is one plus e to the minus w transpose xi plus b times yi. Right, so this is, okay, here's the equation that I plugged in here. Good, last, very last step. Maximization, we are maximizing here. Maximization is generally something that only losers do. So in machine learning, we don't like maximization. Um, it's kind of frowned upon, so we minimize. And so we just minimize this by getting rid of this negative sign. So we just multiply everything by negative 
from a minus one, and then we have a minimization problem. Um, there's no real rational reason why we don't like maximization. It's just a convention. And but one, once it's kind of established, it's, it's, it will be confusing if people maximize things. OK, good. So in order to best position our hyperplane, we basically have to minimize this function here. And this has a name. This is actually called the cross entropy loss, the binary cross entropy loss, or the log loss, uh, or the logistic loss. <coughs> In fact, it has multiple names. And uh, this is a differentiable function. And in fact, actually, it's, it's not just differentiable, it's also convex. So it kind of looks like a salad bowl. So what does that mean? That means it's, uh, it's actually, when we find the minimum, it's actually a global minimum. So it's very, very nice and well-behaved. Um, so it's relatively easy to optimize. Any questions? Oh, actually, people are asking questions. Oh, shoot, I didn't see this. Is the, uh, I see, someone said, how do you, is the finite width of the sigmoid the reason why linear regression allows for some outliers? Um, I see. Uh, so you mean logistic regression, I think. Um, so, so right, so the, I'm talking about, sorry, actually, this is a little confusing. It, it, uh, this is logistic aggression. Um, and uh, ultimately, the, uh, the saturation of the, of the sigmoid is, is, is essentially, you know, uh, makes, it, makes it that basically points that are far away on the other side don't really matter. They all kind of have the same, same loss. So if you have points that are really, like what, what the sigmoid, but nice thing about the sigmoid is it really focuses on the points that are right here in the middle, which is the points that you care about, because that actually tells you how to position the hyperplane. And the points that are out here, they all like, no matter how you position the hyperplane, they will all be very, very, have a very high probability, very low probability, right? Unless they're wrong, then of course it's, it's a problem, right? But they don't, don't affect you very much. <clears throat> uh, oh yeah, okay, good, good. Um, so you said, yes, uh, I meant to say logistic regression. Another question, is one global minimum a consequence of only two separable categories? No, very good question. So logistic regression actually you can also extend that, like the way I described it as a binary problem. You just have cats and dogs or Alzheimer's and not Alzheimer's. Um, that is a logistic, that is a, uh, the log loss is, is a convex function. If you extend it to more classes, it's called multi-class logistic regression, it's still convex. So actually that's, that's not a property of the, of the uh, that it's binary. Um, <clears throat> okay, any more questions? Oh yeah. What is the ultimate function of the hyperplane that we want to find in its, position. So uh, I think what the question is, is the following. If we do all this and we minimize this, what have we got at the end? And at the end, we have this, this hyperplane. The hyperplane is parameterized by W and B. And for a new point, a new test point, uh, we can then compute, let's call this test point XT. Um, then we compute W transpose XT plus B. And that is either positive or it's negative, or greater or equal zero. You know, if it's zero, then it's exactly on the decision boundary. But, but if it's positive, then we say it's in the positive class. And if it's negative, we say it's in the negative class. So, so that's the idea. Um, did that answer your question, Maria? <clears throat> I see. So what is the easiest thing that we would need to do break the fact that it has only one uh, minimum. Actually, uh, the fact that it only has one minimum is great, right? That means that's actually really, really good because that means if you and I have the same data sets and we both run uh, uh, logistic regression, then we arrive at exactly the same hyperplane, right? Which is actually the hyperplane that minimizes the log loss. And there's only one, right? So that, that's, the, that's the beauty of it. So, um, or, in theory, there's only one. So the, the, you know, it could be that it's very flat at the bottom, right? Um, but but basically, you, we can't have that. Basically, there's two very very different ones that actually both give you uh, a, a low loss. <clears throat> what if we have several clusters of two categories? Like ah, okay, okay. So now you know, uh, margin is kind of bringing out the, the the asking the tough questions here. 
So what if we have something nasty like this? And you are, what if you something like this, right? And we would like to classify um, this problem. And actually that's a very important problem. It's called the XOR problem. And why is this really, really important? Because it almost killed all of machine learning. So when Frank Rosenblatt brought out the perceptron, that was essentially logistic regression, just, you know, it wasn't quite there yet. It was, it was uh, essentially the first linear classifier. People went bananas, right? The people, you know, he, he was a psychologist. He showed, okay, we could build an artificial neuron, right? That's what he called it. It was inspired by a neuron. The neuron takes inputs. Um, I don't know how much you know about neuroscience, but basically you take inputs, you know, and then, you know, it either fires or it doesn't fire. And so you could view that essentially as a hyperplane, right? As a basically a linear classifier. <clears throat> and of course, you, your brain has billions of, of neurons. Um, but when people heard that, you know, now people, you know, that Frank Rosenberg built the first artificial neuron, you know, suddenly everybody was talking about AI, and, you know, artificial intelligence was what everybody wanted. Generals were already dreaming of killer robot that would kill, you know, like, you know, thousands of people because that's what generals do. And, and you know, we got really, really excited, you know, there's a lot of funding and so on. And then uh, Minsky, professor at MIT, came up with a, you know, he, he wrote a book. It's called This Perceptron. And in this book, he explained the perceptron and he showed this very, very simple example that you just gave us, the extra problem, and said, no perceptron can solve this, right? And he didn't, didn't try to be mean, right? He, he didn't, you know, he, he, he just described the perceptron the way it is. And that was the limitation. It basically is a linear classifier and a linear nonlinear separator, it doesn't work. But this was so simple that even generals understood it, right? And so they looked at it and were like, wait a second, what? I was, I was waiting for these killer armies, right? And you can't even separate these two crosses from these two circles. And essentially what happened is all the funding for AI dried up and nobody was interested in AI anymore. That was called the AI winter. And so what people did is they actually then waited a few years. And so all the universities kind of shut down their programs. And then the same people came along and said like, oh, we don't do AI, we do machine learning, which is totally different, right? It has nothing to do with AI. It's different because it's called machine learning and not AI. And <clears throat> that's how it actually kind of, you know, became popular again. So anyway, very, very big problem. And you're totally right. It's actually a limitation. I will get to this in, uh, well, maybe, maybe we can get. So how do you solve it? And there's two answers. Frank Rosenblatt himself actually came up with an answer, which is called a multi-layer perceptron. And a multi-layer perceptron is what we now call a neural network or a deep net or something. And that can now solve it. Um, but we are not quite there yet. Um, but there's another trick. Right? And that is basically, you can just take your, your data. Let's say you have X, you know, your data is kind of, now you have X1 and you have two coordinates, right? And you just map it to some fire events. Uh, let, let me write this. You can actually basically map your data, X goes to fire events into some higher dimensional space. For example, you do this, X1, X2 goes to X1, X2, X1 times X2, X1 squared plus X2 squared, who knows what, sine of X1 sine of x2. So you just add a whole bunch of features to it. And if you add enough features, what will happen is that in this very high dimensional space, there will likely be a, a, a hyperplane. In fact, actually, there's a theorem that says if you, you know, there's ways to map your data into an infinite dimensional space, a kernel, reproducing kernel Hilbert space. It's a very specific type of space that some of you may be familiar with. If you do, if you map it in this space, it turns out there's always a hyperplane to separate points that are not identical. <clears throat> Did I answer your question, Martin? <clears throat> so the short answer is uh, the way I described it, that's a limitation of, of the algorithm, but you can just expand the features and add more and features. Sorry, feature what I mean, feature is, is, are these dimensions, right? These values in these dimensions. So if you now basically just take nonlinear interactions between these different dimensional values and create new dimensions, you go from two dimensions to to uh, you know, three or four dimensions. A very simple example would be this, this one. Let's say all my nodes are in the, in the middle. All my crosses are around here, right? 
no linear hyperplane can separate this. But if I map this data into, into the following, you know, x1, x2 to x1, x2, x1 squared plus x2 squared, now you're in a three-dimensional space. And in this three-dimensional space, let's see if I can draw this, all the nodes are down here and the crosses are kind of in a bowl around it, right? And higher up in this, in this third dimension, right? Because it's kind of, you take the distance, but what is this third dimension? Kind of the distance from the, from, the, from the center. And so then I can actually find a hyperplane that kind of cuts, cuts through here, cuts between these two, two dimensions. And, and if you now map back into the original space, the linear hyperplane would become a circle, okay? <clears throat> Oh, uh, I was thinking if X or palm necessarily have several minima, the X or palm, um, no, actually it would still have a, a single minimum. It would just not have zero error. So basically, so um, the logistic loss basically just would find, uh, yeah, well, sorry, actually, okay, good. I, I see what you're saying now. It would be very, very flat at the bottom, right? So it would actually, every minimum would be a global minimum. Um, and in, yeah, okay, good. So uh, margin, good point. So what margin just says essentially is this point here, all these guys are exactly the same, right? Because they actually don't make any difference. And you're right. So uh, uh, I actually said something wrong earlier. I said, there's only a single minimum. That's, that's not entirely right. It's actually every minimum is actually the same, has the same loss. Um, that's right. So in this case, basically, because it's such a, it's a pathological case. So actually, for example, this hyperplane and this hyperplane would actually give you the same loss. Um, and they would both be easily, uh, equally bad, essentially. Okay, good. Any more questions? Oh, support vector machines. Okay, is this the same thing as a support vector machine? Okay, good. You guys are such good, good questions. So a support vector machine, what is a support vector machine? Support vector machine is essentially the same thing as a hinge loss, uh, sorry, as a, as a logistic regression, it uses a slightly different loss function. So this, this loss function is a little different, but it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Uh, uh, it's very similar. What a, uh, what a support vector machine does, it maps your X into phi of X, where phi of X is very, very high dimensional. And, uh, and the trick is that if you look here, you only use X ever in terms of inner products. So the trick in support vector machines is that actually, I don't actually need to expand my whole X into this very, very high dimensional space. All I need is an inner product function that basically without ever computing this phi of X, that's, you know, this goes from R to D to R to D, where D actually goes to infinity. And it's a very, very large space. I never even have to write that, that vector out. All I need is a, in a product function between two different vectors. So I can, um, uh, K of X comma Z e equals phi of X transpose phi of Z. That was the ingenious breakthrough that um, uh, Corinna Cortez and Isabella Guillon had in 1994. So when they invented the support vector machine, they realized that you can actually take your data map it implicitly into a very high dimensional space without actually doing it. Just, just do it in a product uh, function and then doing all this computation in this high dimensional space, where you can always find a linear hyperplane, right? And separate any two points from each other. <clears throat> and you can do this really, really fast because you're never computing this high dimensional space. And you can actually do this, this is called a kernel trick. And the kernel trick you can actually always do with pretty much all linear classifiers. So you can also do this with logistic regression. Um, Great question. Okay, any more questions? <clears throat> All right, good stuff. So now we have 10 more minutes. Uh, this is really, really good. So, okay, where, where were we? So we basically said, okay, well, we, um, Kitten goes for a run, right? Um, we have uh, this last function. And we're minimizing this loss function with respect to W and B. It's a convex function. As someone pointed out, it kind of can look, it can look like it can be flat at the bottom, like in the XOR problem, beautiful example. Um, and 
how do we find the optimal the, the w and we just use, use gradient descent so let me just let me just define one second let me just call this here this is l of w comma b this is sum of these two of, of these guys then what i'm trying to do is minimize l of w comma b and so the simplest form to do this is gradient descent descent and so gradient descent just says i compute because it's differentiable i compute the gradient and i i, I take a step along the gradient so w becomes minus alpha times dl dw so essentially if this is my my function i initialize with any point doesn't really matter and then i compute the gradient gradient points in this uh, points in the sorry points upwards points in this direction so i take a step down here and I, you know, in this direction. And now this is my new point. I take another step and I'm here, another step and here, another step and here. And alpha here is the step size. <clears throat> and uh, I just keep doing this and essentially basically I make no more progress. And so then I have my, my uh, uh, and then I'm at the minimum. And because it's convex, I know the moment I'm, I'm kind of, I make no more progress, I, I found the minimum. Good. We had these two different cases. So someone brought this up already. Uh, what's the limitation? What if what if basically the data is, for example, um, like this? You know, where actually it's not linearly separable, and the answer is you map it into a very high-dimensional space, and then there you can solve it. Someone brought up uh, support vector machines with the kernel trick, or you just do it explicitly by crafting some features. <clears throat> There's another limitation, and that is. What if the data is very, very high dimensional? So an fMRI image is actually, you may have something like 20 patients and one fMRI image actually is like, you know, it's voxels of your brain has like a million different points. So we need a very high dimensional space. And it turns out in that case, the data is, is the problem is too easy. So you basically, what we call, uh, what we call overfitting. So you, you find it, you always find a solution, but maybe you just find that basically people with Alzheimer's have you know a slightly different skull than people uh, that don't have Alzheimer's. That's not really signal. That's just coincidence in your data. But because you have so so many voxels, right? The probability of not having some region that just happens to be a little large, you know, a little different for those people who have Alzheimer's than those who don't is, is essentially zero. So you will always be able to separate the data points, but maybe not the way you want to. And so for, uh, to to avoid this, we want to have a simpler solution, and we can achieve this by adding a regularizer. And a regularizer is basically just saying, you're minimizing the loss. The loss basically says, try to get every single point on the right side of the hyperplane, right? The positive points on the positive side, negative points on the negative side. That's what the loss does. And the regularizer says, but make W have small norm. And small norm, essentially what it says is, keep it simple, right? If there's, you know, <clears throat> don't try to, you know, the L1 norm basically don't try to use every single dimension. I right? try to use as few dimensions as you can, right? <clears throat> and uh, that's really, really important. You know, and, and Una actually has done research on this. If, if you basically want to build a classifier and then you want to know, well, how did the classifier actually arrive at that solution, right? And so if you add L1 regularization, what the, what the output, what the, the effect will be is if lambda is very, very large, then you're penalizing, right? If lambda is very, very large, Right, in the minimum, then basically uh, this term here dominates the minimization. So what's the optimal solution? It's just W equals zero, right? <clears throat> so that basically means, you know, you're not, not predicting anything. You just, you just ignore the loss. You're saying, well, screw the points, right? I just want a really, really simple solution. And then I, I lower my W, and then just to be clear, W has to be greater than zero here. As my W becomes lower, <clears throat> I'm basically getting le uh, uh, less and less emphasis on simpler solutions, and I'm allowing the algorithm to have non-zero entries in more and more of these dimensions. And so slowly, basically, I'm, I'm getting one by one, I'm getting non-zero entries in these different dimensions. And then I know, let's say I can separate the classifier, right? So I start with a very large lambda, I get an all zero classifier, and that gets everything wrong. Well, that's not very interesting. So now I lower my lambda, and as I'm lowering my lambda, I'm, my, the classifier certainly gets, gets better and better. The loss goes down, right? Because this 
is a larger part of the loss of the, of the optimization function. And W gets more and more non-zero entries, becomes less sparse. And if I now can separate my data, my, my data points and not a good classifier, I know exactly how the classifier did it. It basically just used the data points, uh, uh, the dimensions that have non-zero entries. Regularize just a Lagrange uh, classifier. Yes, you guys are so smart. So basically what it is, is just this. Subject to the constraint that W1 is less equals than the budget. That's the optimization problem you're le learning if you're in a very high dimensional space and you want your classifier to be um, uh, 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 interpretable. So you basically don't just want to use all the dimensions, you want to have a simple solution that you can actually interpret. And what, what you will get is basically a vector with many, many zeros and then maybe some values, 1.5 in, in a few dimensions. And you know, these are the only dimensions that gave rise to the classification. I want to quickly give you I have, I have four minutes. So um, I want to quickly give you a, show you just what this looks like. I can share my screen. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think you can now see let me see, one second, I, can you, yeah, you can still hear me, right? Una, can you, okay, good. Um, so uh, I now coded up logistic regression here in a Jupyter notebook, it's very, very simple. And, uh, and so here's what I can do. I can now place some points. <clears throat> and then the moment I add, I have two classes, basically optimizes the decision boundary and finds this is the optimal, you know, the, basically the minimum to logistic loss. Um, so you can see, you know, I'm, I'm adding and I'm kind of doing it live. So as I'm adding more and more points, basically uh, the classifier, you know, immediately adjusts. And now it can be really nasty. I can, for example, add a red point here, right? And so you see now it can't actually get zero loss, right? It can't get all the points right. Um, but it basically informs that, okay, well, you know, to make this not totally wrong, it kind of moves the hyperplane over in this direction. Uh, <clears throat> okay, any, uh, can I see the comments here? I can't see the comments anymore. No, no questions at the moment. Oh, no questions. I will okay, watch. Good, good. Yeah. okay, good, good, good. Um, <clears throat> all right, so, so that's essentially the, the way uh, the perceptron, uh, the logistic regression works. I can also show you, I have two more minutes. Um, here's actually the perceptron algorithm that I mentioned at the beginning. And uh, so here I have blue points and I have red points. And the perceptron algorithm uh, finds a hyperplane, but it's not necessarily one that, that goes down right in the middle. So it's basically, uh, you know, if you actually add points here, you see it actually, it doesn't change. Um, this was the, the first algorithm that Frank Rosenblatt invented. Um, and so one thing, just to give you a little perspective, uh, I can actually now take the perception algorithm and, and because I do gradient updates, the gradient updates are always, uh, <clears throat> essentially the gradients are always linear combinations of my samples. So if I go through my samples one by one and just complete the gradient of one sample, I can actually show you what this hyperplane vector looks like. So here I'm, I'm have digits of threes and eights, and I have my my classifier, my W, and I can actually the W is also just a vector in this in the space, right? Of just 16 by 16 pixels. So I can actually visualize it, and um, as I'm going through it, basically you can see here's my W vector that basically kind of I'm adding the threes and I'm subtracting the eights, and so. Uh, what you can see here is this guy gets correct, and this guy, this is just positive, this guy's negative, positive, negative, and so on. And as I'm going through my updates, eventually I get a classifier that gets every single point correct. Um, and this is what my classifier looks like in this image space. So if you actually visualize basically in this W, you know, this W vector is the important thing is if I, my, my X's are images. And I'm basically in this 256 dimensional space because I have 216 by 16 pixels. I can also visualize my W vector in this space. 
And what you can see is this is essentially what it learns, right? It basically puts positive mass here where the threes typically are and negative mass in the region where the eights are. And if I now take a three and take the inner product with this, it will be very positive. If I take an eight into the inner, positive, uh, uh, inner product with this, this here is very, very negative, right? Very red color. So actually this will dominate and this will actually be classified as negative. <coughs> Does that make sense? And I think I'm out of time. So before yep. Una cuts me off. <laughs> <laughs> what make you think that I will cut you off? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, but I think that's a good point to stop, right, Killian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, well, thank you for thank you. Uh, thank you for this very engaging lecture. And um, everyone, Killian's going to return on uh, return tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. again uh, for the second lecture. Is that, and, actually, is that uh, right? So it's tomorrow and then Friday? Is that? Yes, tomorrow and Friday. <laughs> okay. okay. All right, cool. Thank you. All right. Bye. Well, thank you. All right. So our next speaker is here. We're switching back to um, research talks. Uh, talking about uh, so we have now um, Kevin Young as our uh, speaker. Uh, Kevin is at Sandia uh, National Lab, and um, he's going to tell us about um, quantum uh, quantum computing or quantum information problems. I believe. Um, Kevin, can you try to share your screen? Without uh, further ado, Kevin, uh, take away, please. Great. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Kevin Young. I'm a scientist at Sandia National Laboratories. And I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for putting together such an exciting schedule of events this week uh, and for inviting me to come and share some of our work with you. Uh, together, or today, I'll be talking about uh, assessing the performance of quantum computing with machine learning. Um, so Together with Robin Blumkehout, I co-direct the, the Quantum Performance Laboratory. This is a research and development group within Sandia National Laboratories uh, that studies sort of all aspects of quantum computer performance, including error correction, uh, calibration, uh, characterization, and uh, benchmarking. So the reason that I'm talking to you today is that uh, we have kind of a hard problem in front of us, and that is that quantum computers don't seem to behave the way that we really want them to. They, they fail, and they don't just fail in usual, simple ways. They fail in complex, surprising ways uh, that are often hard to predict. So what I'm going to be talking about is efforts to use machine learning to help us understand what a quantum computer can actually do. So I, I've used this word performance uh, for talking about quantum computers. And I'm gonna spend uh, a bit of time at the beginning of the talk today speaking about what I mean by quantum computer performance. Uh, it's very different from what we think about, uh, for instance, the performance of you know, certainly a car, but even a classical computer. Uh, I'm gonna move on to talking about how we can use, build and use surrogate models uh, for describing the performance of a quantum computer, and then talk about how neural networks can substitute in for the more standard surrogate models we're used to. Uh, and then at the end, I'll close with uh, some sort of forward-looking slides about uh, how we can combine really detailed physical models of our systems, which may not be correct, with neural networks that can help us to um, add small corrections to uh, these uh, and expectations from uh, sort of the perfect dynamics that we'd hope from these quantum computers. So we all know that quantum computers are great. Unfortunately, uh, you know, we, we don't have them yet. Uh, quantum algorithms give us these amazing speed ups for really important problems. We can uh, apply them to cryptography, quantum chemistry, promises to be transformative for material science. Um, we can solve linear systems quickly with quantum computers. Uh, we can even search and optimize functions uh, faster than we can using classical algorithms. Uh, the problem is that the 
the top line quantum algorithms uh, that we all studied in school are essentially impossible to implement on contemporary devices. Modern computers are just small. There's not enough qubits to hold all the information we need. And they're noisy. They, they experience errors. We can't do the small logical operations between qubits uh, with the sort of fidelity that we really ex need and expect to implement these algorithms. So we're left with, uh, with a question, which is what can these systems actually do? In order to address this, we, uh, we turn to benchmarking. So each of the blue boxes on this diagram here uh, represents a, a kind of computer. Um, so for instance, we could have a, a classical computer, like a laptop that you could go buy. Uh, we could also have the theoretical computer science model for a classical computer, like a Turing machine. Uh, we could have the, the quantum computers that you can see at IBM Quantum or IonQ or D-Wave. And then we could have the spec quantum that is the machine that you write down, a, a quantum Turing machine perhaps, or a, an infinite perfectly unitary gate model quantum computer. And we can talk about comparing the uh, a, a member of each of these boxes to one another, uh, or we can compare within the box. For instance, we may wanna compare two real quantum computers together. We can ask how many qubits are there, uh, how stable are the magnetic fields? These are sort of physical metrics we might be interested in. We could also compare a quantum computer that exists in the real world with the textbook quantum computers that uh, we study. So we can ask how good are the gates relative to what we expect? Uh, how good are the measurements relative to what we, uh, to a perfect measurement? Uh, we can study these um, quantities using tools like randomized benchmarking and tools from quantum verification and validation. We also might wanna compare quantum and to classical devices. These are the sort of quantum supremacy demos that we've probably heard about a lot over the last uh, year or two. Uh, we may want to just compare the resources required to solve a certain problem. How much time or money does it cost uh, to solve a particular problem? And you don't really care what the underlying hardware is. So these sorts of uh, comparisons are largely under the guise of benchmarking. Now, the comparisons uh, are not static. Uh, they can change as we learn how to design better and build better devices. Um, and as we learn how to design and build better quantum algorithms. So when we say that we want to benchmark a quantum computer, uh, that can mean a lot of different things. Uh, in general, it can mean, you know, we're looking at comparisons along any of these sort of arrows here. We're looking at, you know, comparing two quantum computers that are built in the lab somewhere. Uh, comparing the uh, specifications of the classical computer with the specifications of a quantum computer. Uh, so in order to get a handle on the kinds of uh, benchmarks that we really care about for quantum systems, I'm gonna take a minute and step back to talking about more familiar benchmarks, uh, those that exist for uh, classical uh, computers. So, the performance metrics for classical computer systems uh, often follow uh, some path through this flowchart here. We have a request uh, that we pass into the system and we just see how the system responds. Can it do it or can it not do it? Uh, if it does it, is it correct or incorrect? And if it's correct, then we can ask questions like, how long did that take? What is the rate or the throughput? Uh, how much did it cost to solve that problem? Uh, with classical computers, we're almost always in this upper path. Uh, these metrics, um, when you buy a, a laptop, you're almost always interested in things like how much memory does it have? How fast is it? Uh, we very rarely care about, um, you know, how often does this fail? We don't see metrics like, um, you know, this thing will get the answer wrong, you know, one out of 
10 to the fifth times. In fact, the reason for that is that transistors fail at a rate of one in 10 to the 27 or so, which is for most practical purposes, almost never. Uh, there are of course some exceptions where this failure path is important. Uh, for instance, probabilistic computing or network analysis. But if you're just asking a computer to run some software, chances are that the hardware will, will run as it's specified. Uh, the software might have bugs in it, but uh, no hardware will be able to fix bugs in the software. So returning to the quantum computing case, uh, I'm gonna focus here on benchmarks that involve actual hardware. So I'm not going to be doing the theoretical quantum computer scientist thing where I look at asymptotic algorithmic complexity arguments of specified quantum computers to say Turing machines. Um, I'm just really going to focus on uh, comparing a real quantum hardware to um, either itself, to a classical device, or to um, a, its specification. Like how should this behave um, if there were no errors? Now, if we take a look at this path that we you know, are familiar with for classical computers, uh, the, you know, you give your system something to do and it does it correctly. Uh, this is the dream for quantum computers. We would love to be in this regime where we care about things like how long did it take to solve the problem or, you know, how much did it cost? Uh, unfortunately, uh, for contemporary quantum computers, success is relatively rare. Even devices that contain enough qubits to run interesting algorithms will likely accumulate far too many errors to actually run those algorithms successfully. So in order to compare these devices to their classical counterparts, um, you know, we may be a few years from actually being able to do this. Uh, these metrics here, like time, rate, throughput, uh, resource utilization, and dollars are essentially meaningless if the computer never actually solves your problem. So almost all of the research uh, today on contemporary quantum computer benchmarks are focused on metrics that quantify how the hardware is failing to perform. This is actually a rather difficult set of metrics to compute. Uh, for most input quantum circuits we could specify, it, it's probably not even possible to verify whether the results are correct or not. Um, much like, for instance, asking a standard computer to produce a random number. Many quantum circuits just produce uniformly random junk out at the end. Uh, so if you ask a computer, a classical computer to uh, produce a random number, uh, it's very difficult to determine if it produced the right random number. Uh, with quantum computers, this problem is um, made even more difficult because every time we make a measurement, we can get a different result, even if it creates the same exact state at the end. So uh, there's also a very thin line between quantum computers and laboratory physics experiments. So the metrics that we end up observing are often very highly correlated with the physical quantities that we can measure in the laboratory. Uh, just some examples of these sorts of metrics. Uh, for trapped ions and superconductors, we get very different low level physical metrics that we care about. Uh, these are the two I'd say leading candidates for um, medium scale quantum computing these days. Trapped ions uh, consist of an array of um, ionized atoms trapped in an electro, uh, in a um, ponderomotive trap where electric fields are going back and forth at very high frequencies. We can ask about how stable those traps are. We can look at the uh, stability of the magnetic field that is providing the quantization axis. We can ask, is this laser, which is controlling the system, uh, giving us a power output that is constant in time? Uh, we can ask, how long does it take for one of these atoms in an excited state to decay to its ground state? Um, Superconductors, we can ask about, you know, what is the Josephson energy of the, um, of the system? We can ask about uh, how inhomogeneous are the, um, 
are the transition frequencies? What are the leakage and seepage rates? Um, how often do these uh, systems go from a state that we want to a state that we don't want? Uh, but when these things are operated as gate model quantum computers, they all share some common performance metrics. Um, which of these metrics is most important depends on your task. But you know, for instance, do you want to buy the quantum computer? In which case, you might want to make sure that the diamond distance, which is a metric of how good your gates are, uh, is um, is really low. Uh, we may want to ask: is the is the state infidelity uh, really low? Um, or we may want to, you know, try to make the system better. In which case, we may be looking more at physical metrics that we can correct in the laboratory um, in the next round of the device. So for this talk though, we're interested in, in one big question. And that question is, will my program succeed? Uh, this is a, um, turns out to be a really hard question to uh, answer. And so one way that we can think about trying to address this is just taking a quantum program and running it on the device. So if we have unlimited access to a quantum hardware, we could you know, answer our question just by running the program and looking at the output. So in this figure, we've illustrated the quantum program as a quantum circuit. Now, uh, this circuit is really just a schedule of the operations that are being applied to the, the qubits in the system. Here we have some initial state we apply you know, two single qubit gates on the first two qubits. We apply single qubit gates on all three qubits next. Then there's a two qubit interaction between the first and the last qubit. And it just carries on like that until there's a measurement. Uh, so when we tell the quantum computer to run this circuit or run this program, it will create its initial state, run this sequence of logical gates and then make a measurement at the end. And if we do that many, many times, um, every time we do it, we'll get a bit string out. We can repeat this and get an estimate of the full output distribution, which I'm picturing here. And we can compute our success metrics based on that. So many quantum algorithms will specify a classical post-processing step where you can uh, take the um, observed bit string or distribution over bit strings, process it a little bit, and then decide um, what the answer to your underlying question is. You know, what is the factors of these numbers? What is the, um, the where is the marked entry in this array? So um, it really, how you process those numbers really depends on your program. And I've taken a little bit of artistic license here. Quantum computers are not fancy purple boxes. Uh, in reality, they're often just a big shiny cryo system with a very loud cryo pump attached to it. Um, now, the problem with relying on quantum devices to tell you what it can do is that uh, quantum hardware, is, time on a quantum hardware is kind of at a premium. And uh, it can be slow to give it a bunch of quantum circuits and ask what the performance is. Um, so we can't just run whatever programs we want whatever whenever we want. We're also limited by the actual hardware we have available to us. We may only have a hardware that has five qubits, but we may want to forecast how a similar device with 20 or 30 qubits may perform. Uh, and for all of these tasks, we need uh, a, a surrogate model that can help us answer these questions without requiring the expensive quantum resources for every new program we'd like to test. So this model should be able to run on a standard computer and answer, what is the probability that my circuit will run correctly? Um, so for the purposes of this talk, I've divided candidate surrogate models into three major classes. Uh, this is by no means a canonical uh, division, but it's useful for today. We, we have um, in the first class are phenomenological models. These uh, construct a success estimate based on very coarse grain properties of a circuit, such as maybe just the width, the number of qubits that we have, and the depth, the number of clock cycles that it takes to run the circuit. Uh, these are informed by benchmarks and they're roughly dependent on 
um, you know, the, as I mentioned, just how big the circuit is. Uh, as we make phenomenological models more complicated, we start to transition into uh, quantum process models. These are, um, you know, these can include many sources of error. They can be built up from low-lying physical models, uh, or they can be informed by tomography, where we probe the system and use something like maximum likelihood to inform the parameters of some model. Uh, they can be fairly challenging to build and are often difficult to simulate, particularly as the size of these systems gets bigger and bigger. And that severely limits their utility as surrogates for even moderately sized quantum systems. So the final class of models and what I'm gonna be focusing on the last part of this talk today is uh, using neural networks. So these neural networks can be informed by whatever aspects of the circuit you want, and they can depend on uh, whatever you want when you're building them. Um, it's important to remember that surrogate models though are never going to be completely perfect. Uh, as George Box is often attributed of saying, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, for us, some of these surrogate models are going to be very useful, but it's important to remember that they are not necessarily the true underlying um, representation of what's going on in the system. Uh, let's see. So, um, an important. Evan, I have a question. Yes, please I have a go question. ahead. <laughs> So um, we all we know models are always you know uh, wrong to some degree, like you just said. Um, then how do we know? How do we judge what to take seriously from models? Um, I think that um, models are uh, really only useful in uh, in understanding. You, you know, you have to understand about a model. What does it predict? And uh, does, it, um, does it achieve its predictions? Do its predictions reflect reality? Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, for instance, we may build low level physical models uh, that, dis um, you know, that we have spent a lot of time you know, doing the, the physics of, and um, we really trust those models to define the quantum uh, hardware, but Unfortunately, the a quantum device is not just a piece of quantum hardware. Like it's not a physics experiment. It's actually a physics experiment coupled to a, a really complicated and probably research grade piece of software and hardware that controls that system. So um, a lot of physicists, I think, make mistakes and assume that their, um, their physical models for the system are real somehow, that they actually represent what's going to happen when they've forgotten large components of it that can be very important. So uh, the example I give in these slides is that, you know, sometimes it, it's possible when you have a Turing complete piece of software controlling your quantum computer that it will only fail when the circuit encodes my phone number or my social security number. And this sounds like a bit of a, an extreme example, but we have seen things like continuously parameterized gates where we have rotations about arbitrary axes uh, can experience, you, you can take one of those parameters and scale it and see how does this uh, system perform as I scale that parameter? What, are the, what is the error in the gate? Uh, and we can see a nice, probably linear trend in some systems, but then occasionally we'll see large discontinuities at particular parameter values that correspond to the, um, the optimizer in the system that is doing the compilation identified for that particular value of the parameter, a much more efficient representation of that gate in terms of its native gates. And uh, all of a sudden you see that the system will do dramatically better at that value of the parameter or uh, and that is, those sorts of discontinuities uh, are really hard to rationalize with physics models of the system. Um, but the more holistic picture where you say, this is a complex system, which is you know, possibly a simple low level physics experiment coupled to a very complicated piece of control hardware, um, is, it's really, you know, uh, 
you should always be skeptical of the models you're building for quantum hardware. Um, uh, it's you know very difficult to um, to make these predictions, and I'll talk a in a little bit about you know uh, some some tests we can do that uh, will verify whether your models are trustworthy or not. All right, thank you. Uh, you know, one thing, one very um, you know, conceptually simple but actually difficult model that you could try to do is uh, just enumerate all possible inputs and store that in a list. Unfortunately, that's impossible to do. Um, the, uh, the number of possible programs grows combinatorially with their length and size. Um, it's also for quantum computers, uh, it, it's not clear that did my program succeed even makes sense. Uh, can you efficiently verify success? Well, for most systems uh, and for most quantum circuits you might want to run, the, the quantum circuits aren't officially verifiable, um, efficiently verifiable. Uh, this is particularly problematic when you're trying to characterize large devices with more qubits than you can simulate classically. Um, the limit is usually between you know, 30 and 50, depending on whether you're you know, working on a laptop or you're Google. Uh, but you have to be careful when you're deciding which programs you're going to use to benchmark devices. So we've put a lot of effort into trying to um, construct a framework where we can take an arbitrary quantum circuit and convert it into an efficiently verifiable one. Uh, this uses something like um, reflection symmetry by taking a circuit, um, inserting a few extra gates, and then repeating that circuit in reverse. Uh, that should bring you back to where you started, which is a much easier state to verify. Uh, there's a lot more theory surrounding this and it's discussed in this paper here at the bottom, but that's the basic idea. We can use these circuits to build up a set of phenomenological models um, where uh, these models are very popular in quantum information, largely due to the prevalence of randomized benchmarking and early use of simple depolarizing models uh, by the error correction community. So these uh, phenomenological models um, have as their key feature, uh, they ask what is the width and depth of a quantum circuit? And they can tell you roughly whether a, a quantum computer will succeed or not. So in this figure on the right here, we run a bunch of these mirror circuits on uh, some publicly accessible devices and looked at their success probabilities. Uh, and we can see that you know, for single qubits, which is this line at the bottom, uh, we can generally go to fairly deep circuits. This is a depth 300 circuit uh, and it's dark blue means it's succeeded pretty well. Um, but as we, some devices, you know, are fairly large, they have 16 qubits in them, but, you know, they can only go out to maybe a few uh, gates in a row before they, they fail. Um, so, these are uh, very coarse metrics. And if you look at any given box here, you'll see some circuits do very well and some circuits uh, fail. It's not like they all uniformly fail with the same probability. So as the error rates models that we build from uh, these phenomenological um, benchmarking experiments get more complex and include more possible errors, they eventually converge to quantum process models. And these are the standard uh, model of error in quantum information, and they generally encompass anything that can happen to a quantum system uh, that is closed. But of course, real systems aren't closed. They're coupled to their environment and a classical control software and hardware, but uh, they often approximate closed systems well enough um, to first order. And so the parameters of these models can often be built from low level physics models or learned from experiments. Uh, the process matrix models let you predict outcome distributions just by matrix multiplication. Uh, every, every gate in the system gets a matrix representation that acts on a vectorized D squared dimensional density matrix. Uh, and the outcome probabilities are just computed by composing this vectorized density matrix with all of the gates in the circuit and then um, multiplied by this uh, measurement vector. So if we know the process matrices, then we can determine a program success probability fairly straightforwardly just by you know, multiplying everything up. 
Uh, and the process of learning these process matrices from, uh, from data is generally called tomography. So we, there's a bunch of different kinds of tomography. Uh, gate set tomography can map circuits to probabilities. Uh, process tomography can map states and measurements to probabilities, while state and measurement tomography, um, state tomography in particular, measure, uh, can map a certain kind of measurement to a probability. But these process matrix models are you know, very expensive to learn, really expensive to simulate. Um, and they come with a lot of assumptions about the quantum computer's dynamics that are not necessarily true. And in fact, they're not, quantum computers aren't a sum of their simple sum of their parts. So in this figure here, we have, uh, we've learned a model for the quantum uh, computer. And we've predicted what the um, outcome distribution of a bunch of circuits should be. What these represent, uh, each one of these big boxes represents a particular gate that's been repeated some number of times. And the little box in here represents uh, a small circuit at the beginning and the end of that that uh, sets up the measurement and initial state. And we can see essentially the, the probability of success um, from our model. But when we actually uh, compare the predictions, these are, this is the best fitting process matrix model that we can construct for a single qubit here um, using maximum likelihood estimation. But when we compare it to the experiment, we see that there's a lot of regions where the, the predictions fail to match the experimental values that we get. Uh, this is generally called non-Markovianity, and it's a big limitation of uh, the process matrix models that we have. So we'd like to replace these process matrix models with neural networks. So we can revisit tomography as simply a way of building a function that maps, say, measurements or states or circuits to output probability distributions. And we can replace those models and those functions that we build by neural networks, which are different ways to approximate these maps from circuit inputs to output success probabilities. And uh, like the tomographic models, uh, these neural networks will need to be trained on real data that we take on the system, but then um, they can be used to predict the performance of other circuits that we've not run. Uh, and we also have a much wider choice of neural network architectures than we do with process tomography protocols. Uh, these architectures are, how to choose an architecture will be a subject of a couple later slides here. Um, when we design that architecture, we, we need to understand uh, that neural networks map inputs to outputs. So in order to construct the network architecture, we need to decide what are the inputs um, for our system and what outputs do we expect? So for our purposes, we'll stick to success probabilities, the outputs, but um, inside the sort of uh, the field of quantum computer performance estimation, there's all sorts of possible outputs you might want to estimate. Uh, probability distributions of certain circuits or um, even low level metrics such as what is the fidelity of the underlying gates? You could imagine that as being the output of a neural network. Uh, the inputs are, um, for our purposes, going to be quantum circuits, but there's lots of additional features that we may want to include. And I'll talk about those in a little bit. But um, even once we've chosen the inputs and outputs, there's still lots of choices about how to construct the network. Do we just want to build a dense network? Or, or are there underlying features that possibly a recurrent or a long short-term memory network or convolutional network might be able to elucidate that we, uh, we can't find naturally. Um, so the, the first thing that we need to address is how to represent quantum circuits. Uh, you know, we, we know that neural networks are good at processing images, so we could just take a picture of this circuit representation and feed it into the network, but that would be extremely inefficient. Um, we could look at uh, machine learning code, uh, machine code. Uh, this is CASM, the quantum assembly language, 
that uh, specifies the uh, circuit. So here we're instantiating three qubits. We have three measurement outcomes. You know, we do the gates and then we measure and those measurements map uh, the, the quantum, uh, the qubits into a uh, classical bit. Uh, we can also take these circuits and rather than just look at this picture, we can encode them into an image that's a little bit more amenable to, uh, to a neural network. So a useful encoding is to take every row of an image and have that correspond to a single physical qubit and each color correspond to a single type of quantum gate. So this, for instance, is a 14-qubit uh, quantum circuit where we have some operations on qubits 3 and 4 and also 12, 13, and 14. Um, and we'd like to you know, use this representation uh, for um, feeding into the neural networks. Now, we can also take that one image and break it out into uh, 25 individual images, one for each possible quantum gate. So uh, the, we've divided this image then into 25 um, stacked images, each of the 24 single qubit Clifford operations, which are the native gates for the system, and then the CNOT, which is the two qubit operation here at the end. So uh, these images are now essentially set up to be fed into standard convolutional networks in TensorFlow. Uh, the, the convolutional layers here of this network, uh, I saw Yunhua yesterday gave a really nice introduction to these convolutional networks. Um, they, um, they map um, these uh, input images um, sequentially by applying uh, filters uh, that can be learned by um, TensorFlow. So uh, the numbers and layers and sizes of these filters can be tuned, and um, then they can be used to extract some features and then fed into a set of dense layers uh, that compute this, that eventually compute the success probability. So um, it's actually very easy to build these networks up in. Um, in TensorFlow. So this is just an example of the code that represents a, um, a convolutional, a bunch of convolutional layers, then some dense layers, and then it compiles the, um, the model. So we can test the performance of this model on IBM Orense, which is a, a five qubit device with this sort of T-shaped configuration. And uh, we can, first build a phenomenological error rates model based on the specification that's provided by IBM. IBM tells you, you know, qubit zero has this failure rate, qubit one has this failure rate, et cetera. And we can look at what is the prediction from that model compared to the observed success probability. And it's fairly clear from this image that, you know, for this circuit, say we observe a success probability of 0.6, um, but we're actually achieving on the device's success probability of 0.1. Uh, these are, this is a pretty bad model, but it's what we have when we go onto the, web, onto the website and look to see how good is this device. Um, so we can then take our, so, and I just want to reemphasize every point on here is a, a single quantum circuit. Uh, it, these are mirror circuits, like I discussed earlier. We can then say, well, I believe that the model is generally good, um, but the parameters in the model provided by IBM might not be exactly accurate. Uh, it might be from old training data, the, the system may have drifted. And so if we then replace those parameters with maximum likelihood error rates computed from our data um, in sort of a self-consistent way, we see that we can actually you know, do a lot better. We still have some outliers here. Um, but we can then say, let's scrap this uh, phenomenological model completely and train one of these convolutional networks on the mirror circuits and use it to uh, predict the remaining 10%. Uh, so we have 90% of these circuits, which are in blue here, um, that are used for training. And the, the purple ones are the 10% that are held back for testing. 
And the, the CNN does just much better um, in terms of the, the mean squared error. Um, the, the neural network can also be tweaked by adding additional features to it. Uh, one of the things that is perhaps the most useful is the, the target bit string here, because the, this is a, um, the, the target bit string says, you know, this particular quantum circuit, if it was done perfectly, should have output 1110. Uh, but we know that quantum devices have asymmetric errors. Sometimes they are more likely to fail, for instance, to identify a one as a one than identify a zero as a zero. So these asymmetric errors can be learned uh, if we tell the neural network what the target bit string is associated with each um, circuit. Uh, we can also add additional features such as the width or the depth of the circuit uh, and the single or two qubit gate count uh, that can just help the system along, give it some features that we'd hope that the convolutional network might be able to learn. Um, these are also very easy to implement in, uh, in Keras in TensorFlow. Uh, you can just merge two models using this concatenate feature. Um, and then uh, you can feed in whatever other inputs you want. Um, so this is the performance of the, the bare neural network um, without the additional features. And when we add the additional features, uh, we have a, a few more outliers, but uh, the, we end up with essentially half of the mean squared error left over. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the target bit string was really the, uh, the extra feature that um, was most helpful. So when we replace physical models with neural networks, uh, we have this advantage that the neural networks has, have no assumptions about the underlying dynamics that uh, could be wrong. Uh, but our you know, physical models and the phenomenological model models have very hard constraints about what sort of dynamics they can simulate. Uh, the, the disadvantage though, is that these networks uh, don't necessarily learn that physics very easily, particularly if the physics is fairly simple to write down, but complicated um, like process matrix, matrix multiplication of a lot of matrices is hard for the neural network to learn. Um, but it's fairly easy for us to sort of understand, you know, we'd like to use that um, understanding about how the system should behave um, and see if we can combine the best features of these model-based and model-free approaches. Um, and so looking forward, some of the future work that we're hoping to do is to uh, feed in as extra features, something like the um, the current state of the system at every point. Uh, for Clifford circuits, uh, that information can be represented very compactly because the system should always be in a stabilizer state, uh, which is a particular class of quantum states that can be efficiently specified. Uh, so we're expecting that, um, that because of the success of incorporating the target bit string, which is a representation of the state at the end, uh, adding information about the state at all stages of the computation will be similarly beneficial. So in conclusion, uh, I'd just like you to take away that neural networks can be really excellent um, models for quantum device performance. Uh, and they can almost certainly outperform the standard phenomenological ones that we uh, take for granted today. Um, but you know, one thing that um, I do want to point out is that some of the systems with a lot of coherent error are very hard to predict. So quantum systems experience several different kinds of noise. Orense, the device I discussed today, is dominated by stochastic or random errors. But some devices are dominated by coherent errors. And these errors can cancel out or amplify themselves as circuits get longer. And exactly what happens depends on the precise structure of the underlying circuit. Uh, when there's coherent error that's dominating, even introducing a single gate in the middle of the circuit can dramatically change the success probability. Uh, none of the models that we worked 
we tested worked very well on systems that were coherent dominated, uh, although the neural networks did outperform their phenomenological counterparts. Um, and uh, I did, you know, I, I spent some time discussing the, um, the tomographic models, but the systems we were testing were actually too big to perform a standard tomographic analysis. So we couldn't even compare against the comprehensive process matrix models that we would have liked. Um, so uh, finally, I'd like to just uh, thank uh, Tim Proctor and Thomas Cadenac at Sandia. Um, and you know, this is the, the funding statement that we're obligated to put up. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks, everybody. So there is a question in the chat. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, there have been several questions. Okay. Um, can you, Kevin, can you look at the chat? Yeah, I have to uh, stop sharing, I think, to do that. Yeah, uh, okay. So Seungwon Lee, to every, uh, given huge success in image recognition, CNN seemed the natural choice for STM images in yesterday's talk, but I'm not sure about in quantum circuits. Is there any intuition behind using CNN instead of other types of neural network for quantum circuits? Um, yeah, so we've tried a, a few different architectures. Uh, in particular, we've tried um, some recurrent models or LSTMs. Um, I am not actually a, uh, an expert in neural network. My background is in quantum performance assessment, um, but the, um, the, the neural network uh, experts at Sandia who I've talked with have recommended um, using the CNN first because it's sort of easy to understand, it, easy to train, it trains very quickly. Um, and while some other networks um, may uh, ultimately be more useful um, and more predictive, uh, we're getting really excellent performance with the CNNs already. Uh, they um, they allow you to, the, so an interesting feature about these things is that the image representation of a quantum circuit does not respect things like um, the fact that certain qubits are adjacent to one another. Uh, it doesn't, you know, we've linearized what could be a complicated array of qubits. Um, it also doesn't, um, it's not aware of uh, frequency collisions that occur in certain systems that uh, make even distant qubits more likely to couple. But uh, what it can learn is uh, that, you know, when it, it can learn crosstalk very easily, as long as we set the, um, the, the size of the filter to be the entire width of the, the quantum processor, then it can identify, you know, um, it, it will learn a filter that says when for instance, errors are happening or gates are happening on these two qubits, that tends to correlate with really bad performance. And that's one way of encoding um, crosstalk in the system. So uh, the convolutional networks may not seem like the natural choice since, we're, since the, um, the representation of circuits is not necessarily natural as images. But it turns out that images do encode a lot of useful information, in particular, simultaneity. Um, so whether two gates are happening at the same time and also uh, adjacency. Uh, you know, if a certain gate gets repeated many times, uh, then if there's coherent error, that can build up. And, and so the network can identify um, certain gates that get repeated many times. Uh, and so, uh, I think that's one, that, that's a couple of reasons why CNNs are actually pretty good tools for this job. Another question from Alexander um, Buck. Uh, is there a way to use neural network to improve phenomenological models? Um, I, uh, I think there is. Um, one of the things that we can, um, so one way to, to think about improving a model is to use that model's output as additional features uh, when you are inputting them into a, uh, a neural network. Uh, so in that, from that perspective, I would actually turn the question around and say that um, 
the output of a phenomenological model can be used to improve the performance of a neural network. Uh, that uh, by using the output of that phenomenological model as an additional feature um, that uh, you feed in with the circuit. Yep. Okay. Um, um, and there was another question, but it looks like that question was answered. So person who asked the question thinks the question was answered. Any other questions? Um, out of curiosity, what are some concrete examples of coherent errors with trapped ion systems or other? Sure, uh, there is a, there's a really nice picture of um, single qubit quantum operations as um, we can represent single qubit quantum states as a point on a, on a sphere. In fact, it's a, a vector. Uh, and operations on single qubits uh, cause rotations of this vector. So uh, the ideal rotations are generally things like um, pi over two rotations about the x-axis of the sphere or rotations about the z-axis. Uh, those operations are driven by uh, lasers. So you may apply a certain uh, frequency of radiation for a certain amount of time. Uh, and if I want to do a, a rotation of this, um, this state from, the, say, the North Pole to the equator, then I would apply that, that light for a very fixed, very carefully tuned amount of time. And if that time is off or the laser power is too high, then that rotation will miss its mark and go past the, uh, the equator of the block sphere. Uh, if it were perfect and I did that rotation four times, I would return exactly to where I, I started. Uh, when there's an error, a coherent error in particular, uh, that rotation can cause, um, you know, after four um, applications of the gate, I can be in a dramatically different state. So I, if I then uh, do it four more times, I'll you know acquire an additional angle of four theta. Um, and so by repeating these gates many times, I can build up um, this coherent error. Uh, so the uh, concrete examples could be laser power fluctuations can give coherent errors uh, if they're low frequency, so that this is repeatable. Uh, there can be the frequency of the light can be wrong. So the rotations can be around the wrong axis. So instead of rotating around an axis in the, on the like equator, they can rotate around an axis that's angled up a little bit. And so the rotation now uh, doesn't take you all the way down to the bottom. Uh, there's um, much more complicated two qubit interactions that can have fairly bizarre and esoteric uh, coherent errors, but uh, there are um, many cases of coherent errors in trapped ion systems. Uh, so I, I, um, I, I was not uh, paying enough attention when you uh, discussed how you turned the circuits into images. Can you go over that again? Uh, sure, so um, I can, let me do, this, um, I'll pull up the, the slide first here and then share it. Um, so uh, each row in this image um, here corresponds to, this is the, the sort of the first round, is that it corresponds to a, a single physical qubit. And every pixel is a single, um, sort of space-time slice. It is uh, what is happening to this qubit at this time. So horizontal, uh, the horizontal axis here represents the, the time and the vertical axis indexes the qubit. And the color here represents um, the, the character of the gate that's being applied at that time. So mm. this is a bit of a complicated way and it's, it, it, you know, it's hard for the, um, the, neural, the neural networks don't actually do very well with this representation. So instead of putting all of the different uh, gates in one image, 
we've spread it out. So every image now uh, represents a, a space time slice uh, where we kind of have a, you know, our filters on saying, where do all the X gates happen? Where do all the Y gates happen? Where do all the Z gates happen? And there's, you know, 24 different single cubic Cliffords that can be applied. And uh, then there's also C knots. So this representation actually so, hides things like the direction of the C knots or the, you know, if there's two C knots happening in parallel, then it's not clear necessarily which two are actually talking, which pairs are actually talking to one another. So some information is lost in this representation. So, so this is, um, these are gates that are being applied to the circuit. That's right. Yes. Okay. And um, so, so this is this input data is sort of a history of what's been done to the circuit, essentially. That's right. And uh, and what do you want out of the CNN? You want so the the CNN um, is going to help us to kind of um, it is going to extract features that it thinks are important from this kind of data and then feed them uh -huh. into a dense network uh, uh -huh. that will spit out an answer. Uh, okay. So the, the actual features that are learned here are a little bit mysterious. I mean, we can go in and inspect uh -huh. the filters um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. take a look at, you know, and try to understand what the network is doing. But I really mm -hmm. view the, the CNN stage here as a feature extraction, saying, mm -hmm. here's a representation of the circuit. How can we mm -hmm. um, you know, process that to get a, a smaller set of useful features that the dense network can then process? Mm -hmm. so, so the training data is uh, this whole sequence of, of uh, what's been done to the circuit and that's right. What, so the what, training data is in fact and the and the and the, and the outcome of the yes, circuit. Yes, that's right. What the, the training circuit did. Is uh -huh. Thousands of these circuits, and then their success probability on a quantum device. So we ran say uh -huh. three thousand circuits. Uh, each one was repeated a thousand times, and mm -hmm. um, it you know we can extract how often did that circuit give us an output that we considered success. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we had, uh, you know, those two separate um, sets of data, you know, what is the input, what is the output, and we use that to train mm -hmm. the network. Um, and, and you and also then, used what the intended output of that circuit was. As that's a right. Feature. So using mm -hmm. the intended output allowed us to go from a mm -hmm. network that looked like this to a network mm -hmm. that uh, looked like that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that X, that has, uh, we can understand that as being physically relevant because of the, asymmet a mm -hmm. the asymmetry and measurement outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and, and the goal is uh, once CNN is trained like this, that it can kind of be, be what you call sur surrogate for the circuit because you, right. can, mm -hmm. you can give a new data which represents the set of gates that you're going to apply and you can see whether it's going to succeed or not. That's right. So if you are mm -hmm. trying to buy a quantum computer, this would be really valuable information to have. And the mm -hmm, current mm -hmm. the current models that you can predict from the um, uh, from just the the data that they give you uh, is not mm -hmm. very uh, highly correlated mm -hmm. with the performance. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I see. Yeah. All right. Let's see if there are any other questions. Um, okay. Oh, there are several more questions. Uh, yeah, so, what is the source of contradiction in design of quantum circuits and the results we expect? That is, why uh, are they not sure. perfect? So, <laughs> yeah, that's, um, uh, quantum computers uh, experience errors. Uh, they are much more similar to analog computers than um, digital computers. They, uh, you know, the operations that we want to do are continuously parameterized and we can get those wrong. And so we may want to specify a particular rotation, but if the quantum computer actually implements a different rotation or you know, it sort of randomly experiences some fluctuations, then the output is gonna be incorrect. 
So we would like to, the, the whole purpose of, of uh, this effort was to try to understand what instructions are the quantum computers capable of doing and what instructions um, are like indicate that they're gonna not, you know, they're too complex, they're gonna fail. Um, so the next question was why the black box is also hard to detect coherent error. Um, so you need to design very specific circuits to identify uh, coherent errors. And as quantum computers grow larger, the, the kind of errors that you can experience um, get sort of that space gets very large. And then the, um, the, there are only going to be some circuits that are sensitive to some of those coherent errors. So in order to, um, in order for your, um, your surrogate model to be able to accurately predict that, you have had to include that, a circuit sensitive to that error in the training set. Um, and we did everything sort of randomly. So, and relatively small systems. So we covered most of the errors. And how does, sorry, um, how no, does the CNN, you, can, you can read it. Okay, how does the CNN scale with the size of the circuit? Um, so the, the network actually does not scale with the depth of the circuit very much. Um, it can learn filters, um, you know, sort of, it, it scales kind of linearly, essentially, the number of filters that it has to learn um, as the, as the circuit gets longer, then it can learn different filters at the end than at the beginning. Uh, we took all of the circuits and um, we padded them with zeros in order to um, like make all of the input data the same size. Uh, is there, unfortunately there is not yet a paper associated with this work. Uh, I hope that we can, uh, can get one out soon. Um, after 10 years of working as a scientist, the one thing that I can now say with confidence is that every paper comes out later than I hope it will. Um, so I will, um, you know, happily, uh, advertise that paper to you and maybe she can uh, share it with the, the distribution list, um, when it comes out. Um, finally, the last question here is what is the benefit of having a neural network surrogate quantum computer? Uh, I think I, I maybe addressed this a, little, um, a minute or two ago that it's a, um, it is a tool for a user or someone selling a quantum computer to convey quickly what the device can actually do um, in, in light of all of the errors that are present in the system and in a way that is hopefully more accurate than the simple phenomenological models that uh, we've relied on um, in the past. So, I have a follow up to that question. Sure. Um, you mentioned that the system sizes that you've considered are outside of the reach of like process tomography and conventional approaches. But mm -hmm. if you if you make a smaller system, and you know give the data from a smaller system that is accessible to process tomography, how does uh, how does the CNN based predictions compare with so, phenomenological uh, models? Yeah, the, uh, the neural networks um, without any additional information have a hard time um, with errors that are sort of asymmetric, errors that depend on mm -hmm. the state of the system rather than the gate that's being applied. So mm -hmm. um, this is- But if you give the target, target uh, right. outcome, as yeah, an additional so feature. The target outcome- But compare the small system to, you know, say process tomography. Right, so in those systems, um, we, we know that uh, if the system is dominated by stochastic error, we can learn a, a very good um, process matrix model that will do a very good job predicting. And the neural network will also do a very good job. In fact, if we add non-Markovian noise, where so the error rates maybe change in time, then the process tomography will fail miserably. Uh, but the neural network can still predict the performance, particularly if the new feature that we're including is the time at which the circuit has occurred. Um, and it, so it can sort of learn slow drift. Uh, mm -hmm. Then, um, 
we saw here that uh, in today's talk that understanding the state of the, the target state of the system at the end of the circuit is a really useful tool for predicting the performance. Um, that uh, that is because of the asymmetry in the in the measurement errors. Coherent errors are a kind of asymmetry in the gate errors. And so if there is coherent noise uh, that really dominates, then a process matrix model can learn that noise um, and do a very good job. But the neural networks that we've trained uh, have not been as successful. Uh, but I, this is one of the reasons that I mentioned at the end of the talk, hoping to combine these predictions. So use this notion that knowledge of the, of the state at the end is very helpful and just propagate that backwards through the circuit to say that knowledge of the state, to see how informative knowledge of the state at all times is. All right, I think uh, our time is up. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Kevin, for um, a great talk.